Apis mellifera, the only species in the family Apidae. Or at least, that's what many Save the Bees news articles would have you believe. Look, the western honeybee is pretty important, and it'll honestly probably get its own species level video one day. But that day is not today. Today we are talking about the family Apidae, the honeybees, bumblebees, carpenter bees, cuckoo bees, digger bees, orchid bees, longhorn bees, stingless bees. Yeah, so surprisingly we don't have one overarching name for this family. Uh, a lot of times when that happens, you just take one of the most popular members of that group and add and allies. So Apidae could be the honeybees and allies. Apidae is a family of insects within the order Hymenoptera, the ants, bees, wasps, and sawflies. So if you want to take a step back and look at Hymenoptera as a whole, you can click the link above. Apidae has almost 6,000 described species. It is a hugely diverse group and spans all continents except Antarctica. It is also the largest and oldest family of bees, bees being the clade Anthophila. The oldest apid fossil dates back to around 65 million years ago in the Upper Cretaceous period. The culprit is a small stingless bee named Cratotrigona prisca, and interestingly enough, this ancient species seems to be social, with the fossil being of a female worker bee. So as the oldest and most diverse family of bees, I suppose we can cut its scientific name a little slack. The family Apidae comes from the Latin word apis, which means bee. So Apidae roughly means family of bees. Now, as you might expect, not every one of these 6,000 species in the family Apidae look the same. And it can be pretty easy to mix up bees from different families. So let's go over some ways you can be sure you're looking at Apidae. Okay, maybe first let's go a bit broader. Bees versus wasps. Bees like pollen a lot. And a lot of them are going to be pretty hairy to help pick up that pollen. And much of this hair is plumose, meaning it's branching, and picks up pollen even easier. Specific hairy areas of the body dedicated to picking up pollen are called scopae. And in Apidae, this is often located on the legs. But don't get this mixed up with the corbiculae, or pollen baskets, which are little cavities in the legs which the bees can pack pollen into for transport. Wasps, on the other hand, are usually less hairy and much more slender. But these are general guidelines, not rules. Some wasps are hairier than others, and some bees are nearly hairless. I mean, look at the cuckoo bees. Like, that's just not fair. Becoming familiar with some of these corner cases can go a long way. Now, there isn't really one trait to confidently separate out the apids from other bees, but there are still some characteristics you can keep an eye out for to help narrow things down. The pollen baskets are a great start, a pretty unique trait found in a lot of the common apids, but there are plenty of species in the family Apidae that lack these corbiculae. One thing all apids do have is three submarginal cells. Yes, we're doing wing vidation, please bear with me. We're going to keep this brief. See this big cell here? This is the marginal cell. Apids have three submarginal cells below marginal cells. And in something like Megachilidae, those are only going to have two. However, Apidae is not the only family with three submarginal cells. For example, Andrenidae, the mining bees, also normally have three. Sometimes you're going to be out in nature and get these wrong. And that's okay. I do too. Finding individuals that ride the line between families is going to make you that much stronger of a naturalist. Speaking of natural observation, let's dive into Apidae life cycle and ecology. Like all the other Hymenoptera, Apidae is holometabolous, meaning they have a complete four-stage metamorphosis, going from egg to larvae to pupae to adult. Now this is going to look pretty different across species, especially because different apids have varying levels of sociality. The most iconic apidae are the eusocial ones, like the honeybees and the bumblebees. Eusociality means they have an overlap of generations, cooperative care of young, and different reproductive castes. So think worker bee versus queen bee. But most groups in apidae are solitary. And others will have some of those three traits of sociality, but not all of them. 
And to make it more complicated, some taxa will be pretty social under certain circumstances and solitary in others. Orchid bees are a great example of this, showing optional or facultative sociality rather than required or obligate sociality. I go over some of the different levels of sociality in my Mbioptera video, so if you want to learn more about that, definitely click the link above. Because of this great variance in life history, it's going to be hard to generalize a life cycle for the whole family. But the four-stage metamorphosis is consistent, so let's just go stage by stage and hop around groups to give you a more full picture. All apids begin as an egg, and for the eusocial species, these eggs are carefully placed into their own cells, where the larvae will be fed and cared for by nurse bees, basically the daycare workers of the hive. For the solitary bees, these eggs are also carefully catered to. Apidae is full of great mothers. But rather than creating these large, intricate hives, the solitary species will burrow into the ground or wood and clean out small chambers. The female will then provision these chambers, each with a little pack of bee bread, basically a mix of nectar and pollen. A single egg will be then laid in each of these chambers and then sealed up for protection from predators and parasites. The eggs hatch into larvae, and it's a little anticlimactic. The larvae will continue to grow in their own little cell or chamber, feeding on those provisions from its parents. Though there are a couple exceptions that have communal larvae. Anyway, social bee larvae will feed on a mixture of pollen, honey, and some royal jelly, a glandular secretion produced by the nurse bees. The future queens will have a diet richer in royal jelly. The solitary species eat that bee bread packed lunch that their mothers made for them. All in all, the stage looks pretty similar. One notable exception are the vulture bees, which also use rotting meat as a food source. So that's pretty neat. Eventually, after a week or two, the larvae pupate, still in their chamber, and hatch out as an adult. Pretty straightforward. Now at this point, some of you are probably screaming at your computer, because there is one type of development cycle that we have not discussed in the apidae. Parasitism. There are three main types of parasitism found in the apidae. The robbers, the social parasites, and the kleptoparasites. Robber bees are exactly as the name sounds. Instead of gathering food from flowers, they'll steal resources from other bees' nests to provision their own. You can find examples of this in the stingless bees. Social parasites are species that sneak into eusocial colonies, kill the queen, and replace her, essentially taking over the original queen's workforce to rear members of the parasitic species. You can find this in the bumblebee subgenus Scythyrus. The third, the kleptoparasites, make up the majority of parasitic apidae. These bees will sneak into other bees' nests and lay eggs within their chambers. Sometimes they'll even kill the host egg before they leave. The parasitic larvae can then grow and feed on that host mother's bee bread to complete its development. All members of the nomadinae, the cuckoo bees, are kleptoparasites. Their name, cuckoo bee, comes from the cuckoo bird, which lays eggs in other birds' nests for a similar reason. And that explains why the cuckoo bee doesn't have much hair on it. It doesn't need to gather pollen. Its larvae can just mooch off of another species. All right, so now we've got a bunch of freshly emerged adult apidae. What now? Well, if you're social, you're likely a worker, so best get to catering to the colony for the rest of your days. If you're a queen, things can look a little different across taxa. If you're a honeybee, you probably already have a workforce. Either you're here to replace an unproductive queen, or maybe your colony is swarming, where one colony splits into two, kind of like colony mitosis. But either way, time to do a mating flight and start laying eggs to keep things moving. Bumblebees, on the other hand, are annual, so they're starting from ground zero every year. The queen will have already done a mating flight the season before, so come springtime, she can just get right to building up the colony. Now, both workers and queens are female. So what about the males? Well, male or drone honeybees really just exist to mate with the queen and then die immediately after. However, in, say, the bumblebees, males can not only mate multiple times, but they also seem to help in incubating developing brood. Stingless bees, the males also seem to have some sort of regulatory functions within the colony. They ain't working as hard as the workers, though. 
Another important thing to note about reproduction and eusocial apidae is that they practice a renatoki. This is a type of parthenogenesis where unfertilized eggs become males or drones and fertilized eggs become those female workers or queens. Now back to the solitary apidae, without the weight of a colony on their shoulders, they can just get straight to thinking of their own reproduction. Whether social or solitary, many apids use pheromones to attract a mate. However, some solitary males will just patrol flower patches and pounce on the females that they happen upon. Other times, the male is even more impatient, tracking down the scent of a female and digging her up from her underground burrow before she even has the chance to see the light of day. After mating, the female will lay her eggs in those little chambers with a nice chunk of bee bread to continue the cycle. Now, despite the privacy of these underground pockets and colony cells, there are still plenty of trials and tribulations the apidae must face to make it to adulthood. The honeybee parasites and pathogens are well documented, from varroa mites feeding on every stage of the honeybee life cycle, to small hive beetles raiding the honey and pollen stores, to hornets just feeding on the workers directly. Social bees as a whole often have whole suites of natural enemies that have evolved to capitalize on the massive resource that is a beehive. They even have to worry about larger predators like bears and badgers. Solitary bees have their own troubles as well. Though not as rich as a whole colony of honey and brood, a big chunk of bee bread and a helpless larvae is nothing to scoff at. And there are plenty of predators and parasites that have evolved to take advantage of these nests, such as members of the Bombaliidae, the Claridae, and the Maloidae. Luckily, some Apidae can fight back. The ovipositors of worker bees in these eusocial colonies are not being used for egg laying, so instead many have co-opted this structure into a venom-injecting needle. And when you've got hundreds or thousands of these flying needles, all fully willing to give their lives to defend the hive, raiding the colony starts to feel a little not worth it. Even stingless bees, though lacking a sting, have strong mandibles to chomp at hive raiders, and some can secrete burning chemicals. Solitary bees don't have as large of an arsenal for nest defense. A lot of their actions are preventative, sealing away the nest to restrict access to the larvae. But one predator of the apidae we have not talked about, and one they consistently struggle to defend against, is humans. Many cultures view bee brood as a delicacy, and will raid hives for developing brood in addition to the honey stores. But honey and bee brood is of course not the only reason that apidae is important to our food supply. More critical is their contribution to crop pollination. People mostly talk about honeybees when discussing crop pollination, and this is fair to some degree as we are a very honeybee-reliant system. I mean, in the United States, we shuttle colonies nationwide to follow seasonal pollination needs. However, other members of the apidae provide crucial pollination services that often get overlooked. For example, one study across New Jersey and Pennsylvania found that wild bees were making up the majority of flower visits in three out of four of the crops studied. Now, granted, not all of these were apidae, but this is just to show that pollination isn't all about honeybees. To further punctuate this, one neat little trick that honeybees lack is buzz pollination. This is a strategy used by bumblebees and some solitary bees where they will vibrate rapidly, or buzz, to release pollen from deep within the flower. This is necessary for a variety of common crops like tomato, eggplant, and blueberries. Many farms growing these crops will keep bumblebee colonies instead of honeybees to augment their pollination efforts. So other apidae deserve a lot more love than they're getting right now. In fact, the presence of honeybees in areas where they're not native, such as the United States, can negatively impact native species through resource competition and disease transmission. That's not to say that honeybees are useless. I mean, in a perfect world, we'd be able to have wild pollinators handle all of our crop pollination, but we have 1.5 million acres of almond fields alone, and our large-scale agricultural systems just aren't set up in a way where that's feasible. We do need the honeybee in our agricultural systems, However, we don't need to conserve it in our natural spaces, and it should not be viewed as a conservation strategy to keep a beehive. It is livestock. 
The good news in all of this is there is constant research being done into how to help our agricultural systems work alongside natural processes rather than against them. Things like incorporating native plants, limiting tillage, limiting chemical usage can help to improve native pollinator diversity and abundance. And for you at home, if you want to help, limit your chemical sprays and plant native plants. That's what these native pollinators need. They don't need you to keep a beehive. That's not a conservation practice. If you want honey, it makes sense, but you're not benefiting the local ecosystem in the process. Anyways, thank you all for listening. And if you like the content, please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future videos. And if you have any personal anecdotes, whether related to beekeeping, gardening, or any favorite species, please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear about it. Peace, y'all.